My biggest fear is that my kids would never be happy again, that all of their happiness would have been wiped away in that instant. And so I turned to my friend, Adam Grant, who's a psychologist, and asked him what I could do. How do I get my kids through this? How do I get myself through this? And I learned that resilience is not something we have a set amount of. It's a muscle. We build it. We build it in ourselves, in each other, in our children. And option B is our attempt to share what we learned from the researchers who've studied this for a really long time, from other people who have faced all forms of adversity. And how do you get away then from that sense that what you're feeling at the worst moment will be with you forever? It's about rejecting permanence in psychologist language. It's about when it is so bad, knowing or believing it can get better. Those early moments of grief, I, I felt like I was stuck into a void, like I could barely breathe. My brother-in-law talked about it, who's Dave's brother, as a boot stuck on his chest, pushing him in. And people told me who had been through it, this gets better. Adam told me it gets better, and I did not believe them. And I'm hoping option B can do that, can tell people, no matter how bad it feels, the sadness lingers, it's still with me today, but it does get better. And one of the ways you can make it get better is just believe it's possible. You don't have to feel it because you're not going to, but you just have to know. And the other thing is paying attention to the little tiny moments when it's okay. I was waiting to feel okay. I wasn't going to feel okay. But a couple weeks and months in, or even days in, I could laugh at one funny thing someone said and feel okay for a minute, a second. And knowing that, and then being able to say, okay, other people have been through this, you can get to the other side, it makes a really big difference in recovery. What was the worst moment for you? Was it right at the beginning or did it hit much later? I found him on a gym floor. I, my brother-in-law kind of pulled me off his body when he was in the hospital and they were like, we have to go. He, he had died hours before I, I told my children they lost their father. Like <laughs> there are so many bad moments. There's no one worse moment. But on all of it was this feeling that it would never get better. And I now know that that's not true. It did get better. I'm still sad. I still miss him. But there are things I've learned through this. And knowing that there was a path to that boot getting lifted off your chest was so important. And what was the most helpful thing? Was there one thing that you point to above all else that helped? Probably gratitude. And it's so counterintuitive. How do you go through tragedy and trauma and come out feeling more grateful? But one day Adam said to me, you know, you really should think about how things could be worse. I looked at him like he was crazy. Worse? Things could be worse? I just lost my husband suddenly. And he looked at me and said, Dave could have had that same cardiac arrhythmia driving your children. I could have lost all three of them in that same instant. Never occurred to me. And actually, the minute you say it, even here, you're like, okay. I'm good, my kids, my kids are alive. I didn't lose all three of them. And finding ways to feel grateful for what we have left, for no matter how hard things are for the good things in our life, is actually a gift. You know, it never occurred to me that Dave would not turn 48. I never occurred to me to feel grateful for birthdays, and now I do. You talk about the moment when you pushed against the bottom and finally found that kickoff to get back up to the surface. What was that? One thing Adam told me was that happiness is not found in the big stuff. It's actually found in the small stuff. After Dave died, I was waiting to feel better. I wasn't going to feel better. And on the way there, I was not doing anything fun. I was working. I was taking care of my children. I'd spend the rest of my time crying. And then one day I went to a bar mitzvah, and a childhood friend pulled me on the dance floor, and I danced for like a minute and I felt okay. It was about four months after Dave died and then I just burst into tears because I think I felt so guilty that I felt okay even for a minute. And I needed permission to feel better. My brother-in-law, Dave's brother, gave it to me and it was one of the most important things that's happened in my life. He called me one day crying and he said, Cheryl, all Dave ever wanted was for you and your children to be happy. Don't take that away from him. And there's a role for social media in grief. You turn to Facebook to write that post after the formal grieving period ended where I remember vividly you said, don't ask me how I am, ask me how I am today, trying to help people help you. 
I know I work at Facebook and I believe deeply in Facebook's mission, but I have a whole new understanding of what it can mean to people going through tragedy as it was for me. You know, after I lost Dave, it wasn't just the grief, it was like isolation. I came back to work, I'd always had very friendly relationships with my colleagues and no one knew what to say to me. So often they said nothing at all and they kind of looked at me like I was a ghost. And so there's that Jewish period of mourning for a spouse, it's called Shalashim at the end of that period. I wrote a post about how I was feeling. And the night before I went to sleep, I said, there's no way I'm posting this. It's too, too honest and too raw and too personal. And then the next morning, I felt so terrible. I thought nothing can be worse. It couldn't be better. And I posted, and it really helped. But for me, having people say, how are you today? <laughs> having people acknowledge kicking the elephant out of the room was mm -hmm. so important and very much the path to writing this book. I guess social media can also be a place that amplifies grief, though. I mean, I, I've spoken to grieving mothers who've, you know, got trolled after a traumatic event. It's sort of unthinkable. But did you witness any of that yourself? You know, 1.8 billion people on our platform, things happen, and those are things we don't want to happen, and we take very seriously and try to take the appropriate action. For me, Facebook became the place where Dave's memories were stored. Mm. You know, people would walk up to me in those early days and still today and tell me stories. And I loved hearing those stories, but you know, in the fog of grief, I wasn't gonna remember all of them and I wasn't gonna remember all the details perfectly to save them for my children who are gonna know their father mostly through the stories because they were so young when he died. And so Dave's Facebook page is where those stories live and people's names and people's faces. And I, I look at it all the time you have such, um, of course, a, a positive sense of what social media can do. But there's also this sense now, isn't there, that the internet, we used to think of as providing unambiguous improvement to the world. And now it feels like the mood is shifting, whether it's polarizing us politically or eating into our privacy or our relationships. Do you, do you sense that backlash against the digital revolution? Any technology I know can be used for good and can mm. be used uh, for ill purposes, and it's our job to make sure that people can share and connect on Facebook and that we take the right steps to mitigate, mitigate the harm when the technology is used in the wrong ways. One of the things that I think really helps Facebook is we have real identity. People behave better when their names and their faces are attached to it. Some people will still make awful comments and some people will still troll, but a lot of the bad comments go away Mm. when you can't do them anonymously. Tell me one thing. The rumor is that Silicon Chiefs know how addictive screen time can be for their kids. Do you have the same problems as the rest of us, or how do you manage that with your kids? Well, I think that there's a lot of good uh, that happens online. Both of my children go online. They research things for school, even in elementary school. They have access to information that I could have never, ever had. And uh, we have rules around screen time in my, in my, ho in my house as well. My son has a phone. Uh, he's older, my, my daughter does not. Um, we have, you know, no phone at the table, no phone during meals, no phone before bedtime type of rules. Facebook's been uh, very proactive in combating fake news. You have this disputed content warning sign now on some of your sites. Do you feel that this is a gesture that you are morphing from platform to publisher? We're really a, a platform and we take our responsibilities on false news very seriously. False news hurts everyone because it makes our community uninformed, it hurts our community, it hurts, uh, it, it hurt, it hurts countries. And we know that people want to see accurate news on Facebook and that's what we want them to see. So you have to become a publisher and editorial no. voice now. I don't think we have to be the publisher and we definitely don't want to be the arbiter of the truth. We don't think that's appropriate uh, for us. We think everyone needs to do their part. Newsrooms have to do their part, media companies, classrooms, and technology companies. We're focused on decreasing the financial incentives for false news because a lot of times it is financially motivated. Do you think fake news though is with us for life or will it be gone? Well, we all have to do our part to make sure that people see accurate information and figuring out how we do that is something that we're gonna have to see and will evolve, but we know the goal. The goal is for people to see accurate information on Facebook and everywhere else.